Um, okay, so we are going to work our way through the speakers, and then at the end we'll answer questions. Um, however, you can send us a question as you think of it using the chat function in the bottom left of your screen. Um, we will take all questions via the chat function just because it's easier to make sure that we answer everybody and people don't end up interrupting each other. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, there's a place where you can type a message um, un under the thing that says chat where you should see a message from me about muting your phone. And then right below that, there should be a little bar with an arrow that says select chat recipient. Um, please send your questions about the webinar itself to all co-presenters. At the end of the webinar, Lacey McNary will be moderating the questions. If you've got technical questions, um, you can send those just to Debbie Stein, and I can respond to those even as the webinar is going on. Um, when the webinar, when all the speakers have spoken, we'll then turn to the questions, and hopefully we'll get through all of your questions today. Um, as I said, the webinar is being recorded, and it will be made available after today. And we also will circulate the slides, because there's a number of links in the presentation to some very useful materials, including some that aren't referenced in the presentations themselves, and we want to make sure that you get all of them. So um, thank you very much for joining us today, and let's get started. The first thing that I want to talk about for just a moment is what the objectives are for today's webinar. Um, and there really are a couple. Um, the first one is we want to make sure that those of you who haven't had much exposure to oral health issues are aware of what they mean, particularly for children. Um, but we also want to introduce some national organizations' oral health goals, their network strategies, and their granting process, um, all of which we think will make it easier for you to engage in this work. And then we want to share state child advocacy organizations' experience with oral health advocacy so that you can learn the lessons from your peers of what they've done, what's worked, and that will help guide your work if you decide to start this up. Um, as I said, I'm the Network Director for the Partnership for America's Children. I think all of you are members. Um, some of you might be Kids Count grantees. Um, but we are essentially a nationwide network of child advocacy organizations that's designed to help everybody learn from each other and be more efficient and more effective in your work. Um, today we have one moderator, and then believe it or not, we have six speakers <laughs> because there's just that big a wealth of information out there. Um, so our moderator today is Lacey McNary. Um, many of you know Lacey, I think, from her days at Kentucky Youth Advocates. Today she is the principal at McNary & Associates where she provides expert and experienced system change policy and leadership consulting services to organizations across the country. Um, she is also an adjunct professor at the University of Louisville. Um, I'm still hearing one person's noise. So can you all please make sure that you have muted your phones? Star six. When you know, if you need to talk later, it's star seven to unmute. But for now, please mute. Thank you. Um, after Lacey, we're going to hear from. Um, whoops, we went one too far. We're going to hear from Matthew Bond. Matthew is um, a the manager of grants and programs at the DentaQuest Foundation. Um, and he served as a grants and program associate there for three years. He now works to develop stronger connections with grantees and partners and implement the foundation program strategy. Before he joined DentaQuest in 2011, he was the manager of client services for Ellipses Enterprises, a grant-funded academic publishing and meeting planning consultant, where he worked closely with foundations to plan and implement symposia and conferences. He also served as an editor on six volumes spanning such topics as the future of physics and the nature of infinity. Um, after we hear from Matthew, we're going to hear from Andrew Peters, who is Senior Associate of the Children's Dental Campaign at the Pew Charitable Trust. He oversees state-based campaigns to improve children's access to oral health. Um, before he went to Pew, he was a Policy Associate at Burness Communications, where he supported the efforts of nonprofits in health and health care to build relationships with members of Congress and other policymakers. Um, he also has been an assistant in the Government Relations Department at, Kelly, at Carnegie Mellon, 
and he worked in the press office of then Senator John Kerry and at the Heinz Endowments in Pittsburgh. Um, after we've heard from two people on the funding side of the work, we're going to hear from four of your colleagues around the country. The first one is Mahak Kalra, who is the policy director at Kentucky Youth Advocates. Um, she manages the statewide Kentucky Oral Health Coalition, develops and publishes oral health policy fact sheets and issue briefs, manages several oral health grants, serves as communication coordinator, and works closely with key officials. Um, she has worked on multiple health issues at Kentucky Youth Advocates, including childhood obesity, expanding health coverage, and smoke-free policies. Then we will hear from Eileen Espejo, who is the Senior Managing Director at Children Now, or a Senior Managing Director at Children Now in California. She oversees media and oral health policy education and outreach efforts. She co-chairs the Children's Media Policy Coalition, which is a group of national organizations that educate and inform policymakers and the public about pressing children's media issues, such as interactive advertising and educational programming. Um, she also leads the organization's efforts to improve oral health quality and access for children in California. Um, then we will hear from Jim Beasley from Rhode Island Kids Count. Um, he is responsible there for analysis, research, and writing on a variety of topics affecting children's health, including health coverage, oral health, behavioral health, and specific health topics such as preterm births, obesity, asthma, lead poisoning, and substance abuse. Before he went to Rhode Island Kids Count, he was a secretary fellow in the Office of Communication at the U.S. Department of Interior, and he also worked at Dynamic Lodge. Um, during his graduate studies, he provided research assistance to Villanova's Office of Planning and Research. And then our final state advocacy speaker will be Dustin McKee, who is with Voices for Ohio's Children. Um, he leads a statewide coalition on oral health. Um, Prior to working with Voices, he served as the Legislative Services Coordinator for the Ohio Association of County Board of, Disab of Developmental Disabilities. Um, his experience providing direct care to people with disabilities inspired him to pursue a career advocating for vulnerable populations and has helped him to understand the real world implications of public policy decisions. So those are our speakers today, and I am now going to turn it over to you, Lacey, to say a few words and then to our speakers. And Lacey, if you're, you need to unmute for us to hear you. All right, All right. thank you. <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk too long because we have a, a great panel that um, I'm sure everybody wants to hear. But I just want to thank everybody, um, all of the presenters today. Um, I know everyone's very busy, so this is exciting that you're going to be able to share um, your learnings and um, what you're doing in oral health with the rest of the network. Um, as Debbie said, I worked at Kentucky Youth Advocates for about 13 years um, and worked on oral health for many of those years. Um, really see it as a social justice issue. And I've been really excited about this growing national network around oral health advocacy. Um, and as, when I attend these, these network meetings and things like that, um, it, it does remind me a lot of the Kids Count Network or the uh, Partnership for America's Children's Network. And I looked around and we saw all the folks on the phone today um, have been kind of a part of that. And I've just always thought that we could get more child advocacy organizations um, involved in this important children's issue. Um, and you're going to hear lots of great stats and, and a lot about the need. Um, so I would just challenge you all to, after this call, um, reach out to um, somebody either at Senequest or Pew or one of the speakers to find out how you can get engaged in this. Um, there really are um, lots of financial um, and policy resources out there for you all to tap into. So I hope that you'll consider um, you know, adding oral health to your portfolios. Um, and without talking anymore and taking away from the speaker's time, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Bond from the DenaQuest Foundation. Thank you, Lacey. Um, yeah. And thanks everyone for having me today. Uh, again, my name is Matt Bond. I work for the DenaQuest Foundation as a manager of grants and programs and specifically focused on supporting the uh, development of the Oral Health 2020 network. So before I get 
started, um, I just wanted to, to start by sharing my appreciation with all of you for all that you do. I've had the, the privilege of working with a number of the presenters on the call today and, and seen the, the amazing progress that they've achieved um, to, to make healthier lives for, for kids in the states in which they work. And um, I just have this sense that, you know, the work you do is so important and it, uh, I just really wanted to make sure that I shared that appreciation before we started. And just a reminder that, that really it, it does just take a few people that are committed to an idea and an ideal to get uh, a change movement started. So this is one of my favorite Margaret Mead quotes. Um, so what I'll do is give you sort of the Cliff Notes version of why we do the work the way that we do, how we think about oral health, and then uh, specifically what the opportunity for engagement is so that we can save time for the rest of the presenters to show you how they've started to move the issue forward. Um, and as Lacey indicated in the outset, we really do take a social justice approach. Uh, everything that we do here is about improving uh, health equity and, and thus in achieving greater social justice. And this is another one of my favorite quotes from Dr. King who says that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied together in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Um, and that really is the, the foundation of the way that, that we approach our work and has become sort of a, a driving impetus for the Oral Health 2020 network. And really the, the, the points on the right there sort of line out the thinking, which is that everyone deserves the same opportunity to live a healthy life um, and that oral health is a part of what it means to be healthy. And for those of us that have chosen the call to leadership to start to create change about that, it really is our responsibility to advocate for those that are suffering from these injustices. Um, oral health is a chronic disease and it's, it's completely preventable. So the fact that there are so many children out there suffering from it today, um, it's frankly inexcusable. Uh, it's most certainly an injustice and really what, what our work is pointed towards uh, fixing. And until, until we get there, until we all have the equal opportunity to live happy and healthy lives, we'll, we're, we'll continue to live in a, in a state of injustice. So, great, we've, uh, we've accepted the call to leadership. We want to do something to improve the oral health of children uh, nationwide and within our states. Well, it's a little bit more complicated um, than, you know, just getting kids access to care or things of that nature. And if I may indulge in our, in our Boston location for a moment, uh, this, this concept of wicked problems came out of Harvard. And the basic idea of it is that uh, some problems are so complex that you have to be highly intelligent and well-informed just to be undecided about them. Um, and, you know, these really are sort of those, those large interconnected issues uh, that, that seem intractable. And the what, in the research, what they talk about are sort of three strategies that you can take in order to, to interface with wicked problems. The first is what they actually refer to as a head in the sand approach. Uh, there are some problems that are just too big. There's no way that, you know, us uh, as an organization, as a leader, have, have what it takes to, to do anything to change it. So we're just going to hope that it sort of gets better over time. Um, the second is, is what they refer to as a coping strategy, which means we probably can't tackle this whole problem, but if we bite off this one piece of it and create improvements there, maybe that has the opportunity to affect the overall problem. Um, and the third is what they refer to as a multi-stakeholder collaborative approach. And what they mean by that is really getting all parts of the system in the room, working together, pointed in the same direction, so that really can transform this issue into a, a much more uh, supportive environment for the area of focus. And so uh, rolled up in that multi-stakeholder collaborative approach are sort of two core concepts. The first is the idea of systems. Um, and this is another one of my favorite quotes here from uh, Danella Meadows, who, who by the way, uh, is the first author that actually explains systems in a way that, that I could understand them. Um, and I have a couple bullet points up there to, to drive that home, but addiction is finding a quick and dirty solution to the symptom of the problem, which prevents or distracts one from the harder and longer term task of solving the real problem. Um, and you see this across issue areas. Uh, you know, with, with obesity, for example, people always say, well, if you just exercise and eat well, you won't have the issue. Um, or, you know, if we just take one thing out of the, the school menu, then, you know, that solves all the problem. But really, there are sort of root causes and, and fundamental problems. And, and where we can identify those things is with a lens of, of thinking and systems. 
And so basically the way Danella describes them is that all systems are a collection of elements that have relationships between them that together form an overarching coherent purpose that none of the individual elements set, set out to, to create. So I'm just going to use um, the example of a football team um, just to, just by way of making it more concrete. So when you think about when you think about football, the elements are the players, the coach, the referees, and the relationship between all of those players are uh, the rules of the game, um, the way that the, the the officials will officiate the game, and the purpose is is to win or to score points. So um, most folks, when they think about engaging in systems change strategies, focus on the elements. You know, as it relates to oral health, you could think about like, well, if we just train non-dental providers to look in the mouth and refer to dentists, then we've done our job. But really, the, the issue is much more complex than that because there's also a relationship between the providers. Um, you know, there's scope of practice laws, there's reimbursement methodologies. Um, and, and divining what the overarching purpose of the oral health system and the health system generally is, um, is not an easy thing to do. So uh, I just offer that as, as one of the lenses that we use in, in crafting our strategy to try to improve oral health. So systems are these sort of complex collections of individual actors uh, or elements that you know, together form a coherent whole as governed by these set of relationships. Well, that's, a, that's a, a massive and complex thing. And uh, what we would say and what the, the, the literature says is that complex problems require complex solutions. And so the idea of a social impact network really creates the, uh, the collaborative capacity necessary for that multi-stakeholders collaborative approach that the, that the wicked problems literature suggests is essential to actually, to actually tilting uh, a wicked problem uh, towards improvement. And what I have on the screen here is uh, sort of how social impact networks evolve over time. And, uh, you know, just quickly going through this, so uh, most networks start as a series of scattered clusters of activity. So, you know, maybe you have one uh, advocate advocating for a policy over here in, in Kentucky and then another one in Rhode Island. Um, but, you know, they might be advocating on similar issues and in a similar policy environment, but they're working independently. And so what happens in those instances is there's a loss of efficiency and a loss of power because, you know, folks are, are working independently without exchanging their ideas and what one learns, the other one doesn't. So, um, you know, when, when social impact net networks start to form and coalesce, oftentimes a hub will emerge. They'll start to reach out to individual clusters of activity and connect them through the hub. So for instance, if uh, you know, we develop a relationship with both uh, Kentucky and Rhode Island, you know, now I know what Kentucky's doing and I know what Rhode Island's doing. So if there are areas of overlap, I can sort of facilitate an information exchange and start to coordinate the, the learning and, and sharing of resources such that there's improved efficiency and capacity. Um, but there are restrictions in a hub and spoke model. The first, of, of course, is that the hub really operates as the, the center holding force and also uh, has all the information. So. In order to get to a fully sustainable social impact network, that leadership and uh, that center holding force really has to become decentralized and spread out through all members of the network. So what will happen uh, in, a, in a process toward that end is that multiple hubs of activity will emerge uh, throughout the network. So now say you know, we have advocacy and all advocacy organizations within a network working with one another, but then we also have uh, provider associations and there's a hub of activity around there. So each of them has a common interest and is sort of operating at, at, as a hub, but then those hubs also connect with one another. Um, so it, it allows for a little bit more connectivity around a specific area, but also still all of the, the uh, values and the efficiency of uh, individual actors being in relationship with one another. And then finally what happens is networks will get to what they call core periphery. I, I know that's sort of jargony, but the basic idea is that everyone in the network is connected with one another um, strongly and, and the network starts to reach outside of itself to pull in other actors um, or nodes to be a part of the work. 
So I know that was quick, but that was an overview of sort of what we think about the issue generally and then what we think are the core strategies necessary to impact oral health on a national scale. So what we did um, is we actually started to invest in the development of a network, uh, which is now uh, referred to as the Oral Health 2020 network. And then we asked all the nodes within that network, if you were going to fix this oral health issue for everybody in the country, what would you do? And from that emerged a series of six goals with seven targets to be achieved by 2020. And that's what you see on your screen here. I know that they're a little bit difficult to read, um, but for the sake of time, the, the two that are circled in red there, I think are, are the most um, important for child advocates to consider. So the first goal there is the eradication of dental disease in children with a target of by 2020 uh, with the closing of disparity gaps 85% of children will reach age five without a cavity. Um, now, in, in case you don't know, why is that at 85%? Well, uh, it's currently 77.3%, but um, of that percentage, that's a national, that's a national overall average. Uh, there's like 85% of uh, white middle class and, and upper class American children reach age five without a cavity. If you look at Hispanics and African Americans, that's around 50%, and then Native Americans, for instance, is down at 20%. So there is really a huge gap in populations whenever you disaggregate that data. That data. So I think that this is a this is a goal specifically that that really highlights the commitment to to equity that the network has taken on, and the importance of focusing on. Um, populations that are not doing as well, thereby raising the overall average for, for the country. And um, eradication of dental disease in children is actually possible, uh, which is, you know, I was surprised to, to hear that the first time, but, uh, you know, think polio, where uh, if, you, if you actually do the work across a large enough group of individuals, we can actually eliminate a lot of the problems that, that kids are facing today. And, and the science is there. We know that the most important time in uh, a human's life as it relates to their oral health is that first six months um, where the, the bacteria in their, in their mouth colonizes. I won't get too technical there, but the bacteria comes from mothers. So there's an opportunity to educate uh, pregnant women and an opportunity to set them up for success as soon as they're, they're home with their, with their newborns. Um, and so there are some really like key and critical intervention points in that, in that age range that if we were able to do a better job of creating the set of supports that should be there for, for the people that need them, um, we, we really could make a dramatic improvement in the overall oral health of children in this country. Uh, and the second goal I, I highlighted there was to incorporate oral health into the primary education system and that by 2020, the 10 largest school districts in this country will have incorporated oral health into their systems. And so another key intervention point that we're, we're aware of is uh, when primary molars and secondary molars start coming in. Um, and there are these things called dental sealants. And basically because of advances in community water fluoridation, the teeth that, that generally are, are most vulnerable uh, are those molars. That's where most cavities form on children nowadays. So dental sealants are a very simple uh, intervention. It's basically a layer of, of uh, amalgam that they put on your tooth and it yeah. stops. Sorry, did someone have a question? Sorry to interrupt, sorry to interrupt you, but um, luckily Andrew's gonna talk a lot about sealants um, in his part, um, and you can get, you can see this chart in better um, focus and also all of the targets that Matt is talking about on their website, which I will put in the chat box. I'll make a link to this, um, to this stuff. Is that cool, Matt? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, it's just um, we need to keep moving. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, I appreciate that. My apologies for for running long. So, point being that the school system is a is a really important setting uh, for children, and there's an opportunity to work with school systems to be more supportive of children's health generally and also oral health. Um, so, as Lacey mentioned, she'll put the uh, website in the chat box there. But the last thing that uh, I had to share with you is sort of our process for for grant making here, um, and the way it works is. 
we have uh, an open call for concepts on a rolling basis. We review them every two uh, weeks, and the idea is if you have, an, if you have something that you're interested in, in pursuing with us, so if it's 500 words or less, and you just sort of jot it down, and it's an opening salvo to a conversation, once you submit it, uh, you'll get live interaction with the foundation team, and we can talk through your idea in more detail. If there is a strong fit, uh, we move on to a proposal phase, um, and we do an open process here, so you can always feel free to ask questions along the way, and we'll work to really develop a shared vision of how what it is that you see as important for your state can fit into the overall network priorities and the Oral Health 2020 vision and goals. Um, and you know, we also review grants on a monthly basis, so by the fourth Thursday of any given month, um, you would be able to, to have a, a response um, about your proposal. So uh, if, I'll also type in the, tr in the chat if you are interested at all in submitting a concept. We have a, an online portal called Flux, so I'll, I'll provide the link in the chat there, um, and you would just go in, register, and then submit a concept, and you can do that at any point. Uh, we review them all the time, and we, so uh, with that, uh, I'll definitely pass it on to the other presenters. But again, uh, thanks so much for for having me, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that come up. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, so you all can put questions all throughout this in the chat box because um, we're going to keep rolling quickly through all these um, presenters, and we will hopefully have a few minutes at the end for questions. So thanks, Matt and um, Andrew Peters. Hey, Lacey, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thanks so much to Matt Bond for um, introducing the idea of sealants. That takes a few minutes, a few seconds off my presentation, which you'll get back. That's really helpful. Um, so I'm Andrew Peters with the Pew Charitable Trust. Let me pull up my slides here. Um, and uh, Pew has been in this space, in the oral health space now, since about 2008, um, working on several different policy issues. Um, we were very active around um, allowing non-dental uh, non professionals, that's other primary care providers, to provide fluoride varnish. We've been um, active in looking at the oral health workforce um, and trying to authorize mid-level providers, which would be akin to a nurse practitioner or a physician, physician's assistant, but in dentistry. And another line of our work um, has to do with expanding access to school-based sealant programs. So Matt introduced the idea of a sealant which is a small plastic or plastic-like coating uh, that goes over the most vulnerable teeth. Um, and uh, we have been uh, sort of looking at ways to expand access to those programs now for about uh, five years. All of these policy goals, sealants, workforce, uh, fluoride varnish, uh, community water fluoridation, are part of our overall mission to um, to uh, look at state policy around oral health and try and implement those uh, state policies that are cost effective and that will lead to uh, millions more children getting the care that they need. Um, we may ask why sealants? Um, sealants sort of came into popularity in the public health arena in the 1970s, 80s, and then early 90s. Um, and they are popular because they work. Um, they can reduce uh, decay, and the studies have um, sort of come back with a broad range, but a high range of around 60 to 80 percent over five years, which is a huge reduction um, in, in oral health uh, disease or in uh, what uh, insiders call caries or cavities. Um, uh, sealant programs themselves are optimal ways to reach children because it's a captive audience. Kids are, um, kids are in school every day, and by bringing care to where kids are and um, identifying those kids that really are at high risk for oral health disease, um, you can craft a very uh, effective, efficient program that gets sealants on kids uh, when they are in second or third grade. Um, the problem with sealant programs, or the challenge, I think, I think problem is probably a strong word, but the challenge with sealant programs is that across states, they look so different. And some states will see relatively robust sealant programs that are operated through the Department of Health that are in 40, 50, even 60 percent of schools. And some states will see a couple of nonprofits doing the best they can on limited resources, providing sealants to two, 3,000 kids. And honestly, there's every um, variation in between. Um, so the challenge is looking across states, 
uh, looking at your state, trying to identify what policy barriers um, may be in the way of sealant programs operating effectively, and then talking about how we may be able to eliminate or alleviate those barriers. Um, for us, we've been reporting on sealant policy now uh, since 2011, and we have four published reports that look at sealant policy in states. And we've been trying to show progress, um, track improvement, and also show where um, as we continue to gain knowledge about what states are doing, uh, show where challenges have started to arise. So in our latest report, which came out at the beginning of this year, and if you search Pew Dental Report, you'll find it in a second, um, we uh, sent an open-ended survey to dental directors or oral health program managers, which are sort of the top dental or oral health agent in every state. And then we also sent a, report, uh, a survey rather to dental boards. And we asked them what their policies were, uh, what barriers they saw impeding the progress of uh, school-based sealant programs. And when we, um, we came back with a set of grades that were A through F grades uh, that you might see on a report card, and then uh, this year decided to add minuses uh, where there were particular or uh, special policies that people identified as being uh, particularly difficult to deal with. So we'll, I'll show you a couple of maps um, from the report that we put out earlier this year. I think this is the most important map. Um, let me just uh, tell you what's going on here. Um, darkest green or darkest teal are places where there's the most saturation of school-based sealant programs, or they're in above 50 percent, excuse me, above 75 percent of uh, high-need schools. And the way we define high needs um, changes by state, of course. Uh, each state gets to sort of define high needs. But generally speaking, it's where 50 percent of the population of that school is on free or reduced lunch. Um, which is a strong indicator, as you know, for Medicaid about eligibility. Um, darker green are places where there are more programs. Lighter green are places where there are fewer programs. And then, of course, red are places where programs in schools do not exist. So you can sort of take a look at how many, um, how many uh, school-based sealing programs your state may have. And um, I will note that uh, this is all based on state-reported data, and some of it um, some states do not collect data uh, annually or regularly on this, uh, on this um, penetration of uh, school-based sealant programs uh, into schools. So uh, the data might be uh, off, but it's, uh, it might be off because it doesn't exist. So I will say that if you're looking at it, uh, your state's color and thinking, hmm, that doesn't seem right. This next um, uh, slide that I'm about to show you here is rules restricting hygienists. So one, um, one issue that we've been working on for uh, four or five years now is um, can dental hygienists go into schools and provide uh, sealants to children's teeth uh, without the prior examination of a dentist? And why this is important is because many state sealant programs have had trouble um, finding and employing dentists for the reason that there aren't many dentists that want to do this volunteer activity on an every year, all the time basis. And then um, when there are those dentists, it's difficult to find the money on a shoestring budget to employ them. Um, it's, it can be expensive, and it can be um, very time consuming. So um, from a best practice perspective, we've tried to implement policies in states and work with uh, stakeholders in states that want to um, make it so that dental hygienists can access uh, children's teeth, uh, can do an assessment on the tooth, and can place a sealant, and, uh, and then refer those students who need care to a dentist in the community. And what many states have found is that this is a really interesting model that has a lot of success, not only um, screening and sealing more kids, but also referring more children for comprehensive care to dentists in the community. And it seems from uh, reports in some states, Maryland in particular, that more comprehensive care, that is more um, cavities being filled, more, um, more um, difficult care is actually being provided through referrals. So we see it as a good model. Um, I will talk about this. 13 states earned a minus in our report um, because of problems with uh, sustainability of the program or identifying specific uh, policy barriers at the state or local level that made it difficult to run programs. For example, in some states, hygienists can't bill Medicaid 
So it makes it difficult to run a program if the main provider of your service can't uh, receive remuneration from the biggest insurer of high-needs kids. Um, in other states, managed care organizations um, had closed or um, – there's another term for it that I'm forgetting right now – but had closed their panels so that providers in schools weren't able to seek remuneration through ma managed uh, care, which present, uh, presented a problem. Um, restrictions on service locations were also a, a large problem. Um, hygienists were allowed to work in some locations and not in others. Employ, uh, were allowed to be employed by some entities, public health departments, and not other entities, for example, FQHCs or nonprofits. So these programs, um, which are crucial uh, to uh, getting sealants on kids' teeth, and which have proven time and time again that they're able to do so efficiently, keep running into these small barriers that limit the amount of children that they're able to see. Um, I'm going to put this slide up, but I'll say one more thing, which is that um, going forward this year, Pew will be looking at um, we're doing sort of a year of research on the, on the barriers, on the state and local policy barriers that sealant programs face. Uh, we'll be publishing that report at the end of the year so that you can, um, or at the beginning of next year probably, <laughs> if we're being realistic, um, so that you can take a look at that report, understand what other states, uh, states rather are facing, see if it compares to what your state may be facing, and then uh, we can work together if you have the interest on eliminating those barriers so the programs can be as successful as possible. We routinely work with states um, on advocacy and policy work that opens up access to school-based sealant programs and makes them more efficient and effective. That's our goal, and we are very happy to partner with any advocates that want to work with us towards that goal. So I yield the balance of my time to our next presenters, and I hope I haven't gone over. Thanks, Andrew. I really appreciate it um, a lot. And uh, we have four great states who could probably each give an hour-long webinar on their, or longer on their great work. So um, we've asked them to very, very briefly kind of talk about, give you a teaser on what it is they are doing and um, to give you some ideas. And Mahek, I'm going to start with you. Okay, sounds great. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Mahek Kalra. I'm the Oral Health Policy Director at Kentucky Youth Advocates. So I'll be talking about Kentucky. Um, so when, you think, when we think about oral health landscape in Kentucky, we see a lot of opportunity systems need – oh, let me move my slides. Sorry. Um, we see a lot of opportunity systems, needs, movement, people, prevention, links to the past, and also a new frontier. But we also see synergy, cooperation, and network. We're optimistic but also hopeful, but we're also realistic. Um, we hope to create a culture of good health um, through increasing oral health literacy, improving access to care for all, and then also um, better integrating the services into school settings. So with that being said, um, we hope, like Matt mentioned, we're hoping to create a network. So we're weaving a network together. We know that we can accomplish more than, um, and also there's so much work to do to improve oral health in Kentucky. This next picture is graphic, so just giving you a forewarning. Um, unfortunately, dental professionals, um, not only in Kentucky, but also across the country, see children's mouths that look like this. Um, this image. So what we hope to achieve in Kentucky. Um, we want children in Kentucky to be healthy. Um, we want to surround them with better access to oral health. Um, we also want to surround children with adults who know the importance of oral health. Um, lastly, we, lastly, we also want to create a system that's well connected. Now we do face a lot of challenges in Kentucky. Um, we know good oral health care is critical to overall health. Um, and while tooth decay and other dental disease can have long-lasting impacts on um, long-term health and employability, some Kentuckians go without, without dental care because they can't find a dentist, they can't um, afford care, they lack dental insurance, or they're unaware of the importance of, um, dental, the importance of dental care. Um, Something unique to Kentucky um, is the geography. Um, we're a pretty large state, or a long state, I should say. Um, as you can see in the middle, um, in Louisville region, which is the heavily populated area, we have double the rate of dentists 
a general dentist and pediatrics dentist than, as you could see, in Appalachia or even Western Kentucky. Also, another barrier that we face is um, we see a decline in children receiving dental services that are en enrolled in Medicaid or KCHIP. So you may ask, after all these barriers, what are we doing? Well, um, oh, sorry, um, let me tell you some more of Kentucky statistics. Um, so in Kentucky, we rank 45th in percent of children with untreated dental decay. We also were given a C um, by Pew Center on State's report in children's oral health. And also, um, we rank fifth in the nation for toothlessness. So you may ask now um, what we're doing in Kentucky to improve this. Well, um, Kentucky Youth Advocates, we are the backbone support, organizational support for the Kentucky Oral Health Coalition. And this is a project that has been funded by DentaQuest for the past five years, and we're actually going on to our fifth year right now. Um, this project has been aimed to create a sustainable statewide oral health coalition in Kentucky, and ha it has progressed um, exponentially the past five years. Um, our mission is to improve oral health for all people in Kentucky. Um, we, we hope to engage partners from across the state to create a collaborative oral health literacy campaign. We want to educate parents. Um, we want to also activate policymakers, um, inspire health professionals, and engage the general public to, un to create an optimal oral health for all. Um, the, like I said, the coalition operates on a theory of um, creating, a, it takes a collaborative network to engage partners from across the Commonwealth to meet our core mission. Um, as you can see, we have a very diverse membership. It's not just the dental community. We have um, educators, we have social workers, we have parents, um, public health departments, teachers, um, and not only is our coalition membership diverse, but also they represent diverse regions in the state, including rural Appalachia, um, urban cities, communities large and small. So we have three um, major priorities that we're focus on, focusing on currently. We hope to improve oral health awareness for all Kentuckians, expanding um, we also want to expand school-based oral health services. And lastly, we want to increase access to um, care in Kentucky. Um, we see so much room for better collaboration because Kentucky has so many rich resources across the state. Um, and the rich resources that I'm talking about are people that are doing amazing things to improve oral health. Um, what we hope to do in this next year is engage local coalitions, develop um, a statewide interactive map, and also develop a shared statewide policy agenda so we'll reach deeper into the local communities as well as um, have that broad statewide presence that we've had. Um, that's all for me, so I was just going to send it over. Thank you so much, Mahek. I really appreciate it. Um, well, it's now going to move to a good friend, Eileen Espejo from California, who's going to talk about the, the great work they've done there. Great. Thanks, Lacey. Um, so Eileen Espejo from Children Now in California. Um, we, as um, Deborah had said, um, I lead our policy and advocacy work here on children's access to oral health services, primarily through Medicaid reform. And why it's important in California is because we have five and a half million children who are enrolled in Medi-Cal, um, what we call our state's Medicaid program, and that's over half of our state's kids. So I'm just going to jump in with a couple of projects that we've been doing. Um, one is a medical dental collaboration project that we've been leading in Los Angeles County for several years with Dental Quest Foundation support. Uh, we have been applying strategies to increase oral health utilization, specifically in Los Angeles County for zero to six year olds by engaging and equipping the primary care providers who are assigned to those children so that the primary care providers have referrals, uh, have the support um, and the resources to refer children who are assigned to them to a dentist and to ultimately ensure that an appointment made is actually kept. So our pilot identified the top practices in Los Angeles County with the highest numbers of non-utilizing children, those kids who haven't had a dental visit in the past year, um, as determined by data that was supplied by the dental managed care plans and our fee-for-service. Um, plan and then using the data to equip the primary care provider with lists of children who are assigned to them who haven't had that dental visit. So this slide right here is just showing you some of the resources that we've given to the primary care providers. They get um, all health literacy 
uh, brochures that they can share with the parents. Um, they also get a prescription pad form that they can use at the child's well-child visit to say, you know, according to our records, we haven't taken your child to the dentist, so we really want to make sure that you're going to um, take your child to see a dentist. We also equip them with dentists who accept Medicaid providers, which I'm sure is probably an issue in, in um, several of the states here that are on the call and, and certainly here in California. Um, what we're so thrilled about with this particular project is that um, the state of California was actually able to secure federal funding to apply the model that we started here to start to educate OBGYNs and pregnant women that are assigned to them um, using the same kind of data sharing agreement that we were able to achieve through this pilot. Um, the other thing that we've done here at Children Now is also using data and transforming those into infographics that we can use to educate stakeholders and especially policymakers. So this slide is just showing you an infographic that we put together from December 2013 where we showed that there's a real dearth of providers who accept Medicaid generally. Um, and in, in particular, there are a lot of counties here in California, we have 58 of them, but um, there are a lot of counties here in the state that don't even accept um, that we're child dentists, dentists who have been specifically trained to serve children. Um, a lot of counties here just don't have that, um, that kind of provider. So this has been a real problem for children enrolled in Medicaid to even find somebody to look into their mouths. Um, so the other opportunities that we've seen are to continue to engage with the regulatory agencies and to continue to educate policymakers um, with recommendations to increase access. There was a huge um, audit that was done of our fee-for-service program, um, and that's kind of really set the stage for advocates and stakeholders to see that the recommendations that were in that audit report um, are actually implemented and realized. Uh, where Andrew was talking about school-based sealant programs, California actually lost ours in 2009. So there are some counties that are able to, just by way of cobbling their own funding together, have some school-based sealant programs, but we haven't had state-funded salient programs since 2009, so Children Now has um, made that a priority to help restore funding to that program. And then finally, just recently, um, we had been without a state dental director for over a decade, um, and he has started, his name is Dr. Jay Kumar, he came from New York, um, and Children Now is co-chairing his Access to Care Committee um, to develop a state oral health plan. So we are um, super involved with that process and look forward to helping him implement the recommendations that come forth from that plan. Um, I'm going to go ahead and throw it over to Jim Beasley from Rhode Island Kids Count. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Um, and just like so many other uh, organizations that you've heard thus before, we are also a database advocacy organization um, called Rhode Island Kids Count. We were founded in 1994. We've had a very strong emphasis about showing similar to Kentucky and California. Uh, just overall dental utilization within your Medicaid program, which is what that chart is that you're looking at right now. So that's basically saying that half of all of our children under age 21 uh, go to the dentist and the other half don't. Um, and we also provide in our fact book, which is the bottom right-hand corner of all the children looking at the cookies, uh, we also highlight the number of hospitalizations, ED visits, uh, commercial pediatric dental enrollments. Um, so we try to put forth uh, a wide picture of what's going on with utilization and also outcomes of children um, through data. So I encourage everyone to sort of team up with your Department of Health to also uh, get the latest data, and that can help begin starting a conversation amongst all these stakeholders um, to get them more involved about oral health and the needs that are causing. Uh, and additionally, at Rhode Island Kids Count, we have been also had a long history of sort of oral health advocacy in general. We've had a leadership role within our Rhode Island Oral Health Commission. It was founded in 2000 and it actually grew out of a Senate report about sort of how do we increase uh, adult, uh, adult dental care and then it's also expanded to children. And so our deputy director at Rhode Island Kids Count for three years was a co-chair of the commission, which every couple of years um, it's always lieutenant governor and a new person, so we've had sort of a leadership role formally, but also informally we've been um, a member of its steering committee and we also uh, attend sealant work group meetings as well. So you'll see that sealant is a theme across many states. Uh, we also do a lot of advocacy and support for Right Smiles, which is, which is our Rhode Island's Medicaid and CHIP program. It's for kids under age 16. Um, and there's only one dental carrier that does it. So we've been able to actually team up with them and also state um, 
administrators and also other community organizations like the health center associations here in Rhode Island uh, to have monthly calls in and work plans to get sort of updates about how um, is utilization going and what are their strategies that we could all debate and think through to help uh, improve outreach, enrollment, utilization, reporting, and retention. So it's an interesting convening table that's um, sort of been instituted out of the Oral Health Commission. Um, and just because we're a community active partner, we've been able to participate in those monthly meetings. And I would encourage you to reach out to your state officials and others to potentially see um, if you could convene such a table once, again, I think the data is a good entree into sort of those worlds. Um, also, the Affordable Care Act has, that has passed, uh, we've also uh, dipped our toe as an organization into basically administrative advocacy regarding pediatric essential health benefits, especially with the dental component. So we were submitted comments to uh, ensure that the la latest benchmark that they chose also includes sealants, so you'll seeing that theme again. But we've also been trying to push our health exchange, which is a state-based exchange here, to allow um, pediatric dental benefits to be embedded with uh, medical dental plans as well. Um, they're allowed on the individual market, but not our small employer market for some reason, and so we're trying to get rid of that inconsistency. So um, consumers have the same choice on both markets of how they access their dental benefits. Um, and we've also approached our Office of the Health Insurance Commissioner to see if we can sort of remediate uh, this issue with out-of-pocket costs that occur when you have a standalone plan plus a medical only plan. So we've produced briefs that sort of explain that and have done some advocacy. We haven't gotten a lot of momentum on that. Um, we've also uh, done a lot of advocacy when it comes to promoting our Teeth First campaign, uh, which is a uh, DentaQuest funded initiative that's been around for uh, a couple of years in Rhode Island and it promotes early dental visits. Uh, it's a bilingual statewide campaign uh, just like in Kentucky, we team up with uh, not just oral health advocates, but also community organizations. We had a whole steering committee develop sort of what the campaign looks like and the messaging. And we've been able to develop a lot of bilingual resources when it comes to um, flyers, uh, videos, social media. What you're looking at now is what the home page looks like. Our latest one is we were able to team up with a uh, safety net dental site and a couple of hygienists to come up with a uh, chair side resource about how to explain nutrition to various families, especially when they come for an early dental visit. Uh, we've also pro uh, given um, developed resources for providers, specifically regarding uh, reimbursement as well for dental professionals, and also about oral health um, screening uh, and training for our pediatricians as well. And so we have a blog, and we've been actively promoting that content through our own Rhode Island Kids Count uh, digital media channels, but also out there collaborating with other initiatives as well. And just to give you a scope of reach, since you know the past couple of years, we've had over almost 6,000 Rhode Island visitors visit the website, which we think is, again, it's another resource to help uh, develop people and get them engaged in this issue, um, whether it be multi-audience, to hopefully improve the impact that Matt was talking about earlier, which is that no kid under five has a cavity. Um, so I will keep this train moving and pass it over to Dustin. Thank you so much, uh, James. Uh, I think I'm working this right here. Uh, my name is Dustin McKee from um, Voices for Ohio's Children. Uh, we're Ohio's uh, nonpartisan nonprofit multi-issue advocacy organization. Um, and I'm going to skip through some of these slides. I know we're running short on time, so I just want to kind of get to the skinny here. Um, Voices has been involved in leading on a number of issues, including youth development, um, health, and, uh, and, and, and oral health in particular, um, which is why we lead and um, chair the uh, Children's Oral Health Action Team here in Ohio. Um, we call it COHAT. Um, COHAT was inspired by the Ohio Department of Health Directors Task Force in 2009, um, and that was focused on oral health and access to dental care. And so the members of that group wanted to move forward and continue uh, to push for uh, better oral health policy in Ohio. And so we've been doing this work for a number of years now. Uh, we're a pretty broad-based coalition. Uh, in addition to having the dentists and hygienists um, as part of our coalition, uh, we also work with our Ohio Department of Health, uh, so we have representatives from the state agency on our coalition. Um, we also work with the universities, um, both of our dental colleges here in Ohio at Case Western Reserve University and the Ohio State University um, have representatives on COHAT. Uh, and we also work with our community health centers associations, uh, which is those federally qualified health centers, which often have um, 
dental clinics embedded in them, um, and then various hospitals and uh, advocacy groups, provider groups, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Ohio chapter is a part of us. Um, so because we're such a broad-based coalition, we don't work on anything that has to do with scope of practice issues, uh, but we are able to get a lot done regardless um, of that uh, uh, prohibition. Um, obviously, we want to educate uh, professionals and the general public about the importance of children's oral health, um, and we work with lawmakers uh, in order to ensure that they have that issue at the top of their agenda. Um, as is in, in many other states and across the United States, dental care, uh, according to our recent uh, Medicaid survey of households, uh, is the number one on my health need for Ohio's children. We have about 51% of our third graders with a history of tooth decay, about one in five. Uh, third graders in Ohio have uh, untreated cavities and um, you know hundreds of thousands that have never even seen a dentist. Uh, so that's obviously a huge issue. Um, but we have made some progress. Uh, I'll just kind of tick through some of the recent stuff we've been able to accomplish. Um, in 2014, we just finished uh, the 130th Ohio General Assembly uh, and we were able to pass a bill, House Bill 483, which established uh, a dental Medicaid reimbursement study group. Um, also, we were able to double the capacity of not only the Ohio Dentist Student Loan Repayment Program, but also the Ohio Dentist uh, Dental Hygienist Repayment Program. Um, we were able to get a temporary volunteer license to help providers participate in free care events, uh, expanded our Ohio First Scholarship Program, which was initially created for medical professionals um, to keep them here in Ohio to reduce the brain drain that we often see in some of the Midwestern states and across the nation, um, and that will apply to dental education now. Um, we've also made some progress in, in the recent state budget. We do our budget every two years in our odd number of years in Ohio, and we were able to get uh, the first Medicaid dental rate increase in 15 years. The, first, uh, the last time we had an increase was in the year 2000. Uh, we were able to get a 1% increase across the board. Obviously, that's tiny, so we worked to try and make sure that that went to certain vital procedures. Uh, we had a 5% increase in Medicaid rates for 52 rural counties in Ohio, uh, and that was really pushed by uh, one of the lawmakers we've worked with uh, um, from rural Ohio, just right there on the, uh, the, the border of Kentucky, there on the Ohio River uh, in Scioto County, uh, the finance chair of the Ohio House. Uh, we were able to get a, a rule change. This kind of alludes to what Andrew was talking about with non-dental providers uh, applying a chloride varnish. It previously was only reimbursable under Medicaid up to three years of age. Now it's up to the sixth birthday, and that just went into effect on uh, January 1st. So we're spreading the word to our Medicaid managed care plans and ensuring that the provider groups are telling their members uh, that this is now reimbursable up to age six. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very cost-effective way to prevent uh, dental decay in, in young folks. And, and as I said, we're constantly in contact with the Ohio General Assembly. Um, we just went on a big tour of the state. We did a six-hour training for not only dental providers, but uh, non-dental providers. We even had some social workers and um, some nurses there uh, for uh, a discussion about prenatal oral health and treating children from birth to age three. Uh, and so we had about uh, 300 people participate in that. We distributed a lot of materials. Uh, we're keeping in touch with those folks. Those, uh, you know, individuals that attend become part of our grassroots network um, and uh, really help strengthen our hand when we're advocating. So just quickly, um, obviously Medicaid reimbursement rates for dental providers is a huge issue that we're going to continue to push for. We feel like we're well positioned here in 2016 to do that because uh, one of our most active members, uh, we chairs one of our committees, uh, was just uh, appointed as the dental director for Ohio's uh, Medicaid program. Um, so we've got a guy on the inside working uh, for, for, for children's oral health. So we're excited about that. Um, we want to establish some minimum standards for dental, uh, mobile dental units, uh, help local water authorities uh, um, have more flexibility for community water fluoridation, um, and then integrate oral health into non traditional settings. And um, that would include early intervention, um, early care, primary and secondary education settings. Etc. But we've been working here in Ohio uh, with the Health Path Foundation. They have two priorities. They work on domestic violence issues and on oral health. Um, so that's uh, our main source of funding. We've got a small grant from the uh, Delta Dental Foundation and, and, and have some other sources of funding. But um, really the way that we've made sure to, to partner with them is to uh, 
to keep our focus on evidence-based progress. Uh, we've been developing data sets that we want to track, and we want to improve those data sets as well, including the Medicaid information before 16 data that goes to uh, uh, CMS over the years in states, and sometimes that can be possible. Um, and then just making sure that the members that we recruit as we grow our coalition are constantly engaged and that we have work plans and, and achievable goals. So um, we're very excited to, uh, to be a part of the, the work that we've started collaborating a little bit with DentaQuest and, and uh, been a part of the Partnership for America's Children. Just uh, really appreciate the um, opportunity to present to you all today. Thanks so much. Um, unfortunately, we hit this 3 o'clock hour, and a couple of our um, speakers turned into pumpkins and left us. Um, I think rather than take questions now, if you have them, please email them to me, and I will share them with our presenters and get you answers and where it's helpful get them to everybody. I also want to let you know that I will be circulating the slides from the webinar shortly after today. And at the end of the slides, we actually have some additional resources and some information about the work that's been done in New York State by our partner, um, member, the partner membership, the Schuyler Center there. I would love to would add love any resources the rest of you have, so I will hold off on circulating the slides till tomorrow in case you want to send me anything that you've got. And then a little bit later down the road, we will also uh, share the recording itself from this webinar. Um, in the meantime, thank you all. And Lacey, did you want to say anything before we log off? No, just thank you all and hope to see you all uh, following up on some of these resources. Great. Thanks, everybody, so much. And have a good day. And for those of you in the East, um, stay warm and dry. Bye. Thank you. Please stand by.